Carlos and Carlos Danel, the CEO of Compartamos Banco, Eun Lalia Arboleda de Montes, President of BCSC in Colombia, and Stelio Gama Lira, the Executive Director of Credit Amigo uh, Brazil. In a moment, I'll ask our panelists to address this topic. After the remarks, we'll go to questions in the format that we've been using all day with submitting written questions. Normally, as a panelist chair, I go last, but this is actually the third in a series of conversations on this topic, um, and I'd like to provide some continuity, so I'll actually make a few remarks at the outset. Um, there is this big supply-demand mismatch, um, and by the way, this the original session in Halifax uh, was, I was presenting a paper uh, that two authors and myself wrote, uh, more or less this exact title. Um, and we, what we did is to explore exponential growth and how to make it go right and go fast. We looked at where it was, look at where it wasn't happening, but we looked at where it was happening. We looked at the Kasha Foundation, Zakura, and Axie in Ethiopia were our three major case studies. After taking a look at, a brief look at what happened in Bangladesh that put them on such a high growth trajectory, we tried to distill lessons and learnings from those three case studies. Uh, we presented in Halifax, and then in Bali, uh, Roshani Zafar and I made some minor modifications based on what we learned, and this was right before the financial crisis uh, we offered them. We basically found that there were six factors that we felt were almost essential to a rapid growth scenario, four that were very important. I'll just name them. If you'd like to look at them, the, the original paper is published in the book, More Pathways Out of Poverty, which is available in French, Spanish, and English. Uh, from the Microcredit Summit campaign, and, um, and at least the English version from Primarian Press. And it and should be downloadable, Sam says. Um, so what were those? We said the six that we analyzed, the most important factors were strong entrepreneurial leadership, um, that this was not in place. I mean, or some organizations are led by more kind of technocrats, or, um, but these were people who are the most oldest entrepreneurs, Performance-based financing available to these uh, MFIs. If they performed, the money would be there quarter by quarter to grow. Some degree of regulatory support, whether explicit or implicit. A focus on microfinance. So these are groups that that's their core business. Focus committed to sustainability, and they've carefully defined their niche, and they're addressing that niche market, that segment of the poor. Uh, there should be a large unserved market in that country. Uh, the, that organization should be able to attract, harness, and retain talent, people, um, effectively. And it needs to be able to manage its information uh, so it can make decisions based on new information quickly. So those were the six factors we saw as common to those three and many others. There were four others. We saw that there was important to have five senior staff positions filled with very capable people. We distilled those as we thought were most important. One of them, which was a little surprising for some, was the chief of internal audit. Uh, and the other four, the fairly obvious ones. Set two, uh, good governance and stakeholder support. A strong board of directors uh, in particular. Uh, third, um, a well-designed financial products that really met the needs of their core clientele. And fourth was a certain level of macroeconomic stability in the country. Um, so this is what we, we presented, we thought were the key factors, kind of a checklist. Um, now, subsequently, um, two things happened after the, the Valley update presentation, the world financial crisis, and also uh, two of the three case study organizations we looked at ran into some significant difficulty after having scaled up. So then we, we looked and we said, were, were we wrong? Uh, was our analysis wrong or, or what happened here? To briefly make the point, I think that um, the basic basic uh, arguments we made we think are still valid in the scaling up scenario. Um, we the two the choices of the MFI. So one, the Zakora Foundation we mentioned in the paper took some real risks in how it scaled up. We applauded those risks, but it seems like some of those risks came back to haunt it later on. Uh, perhaps a, a different choice of an MFI would have been more appropriate for the paper, but that hindsight. Uh, is uh, always better than foresight. Uh, secondly, the Kasha Foundation had some very unique uh, problems that emerged. We 
couldn't have anticipated. We fully expect them, though, to recover and to regain their growth trajectory. So bearing those in mind, just four points about what we, how we would revise the paper now. Um, one of which is that perhaps it sounds obvious, but slower growth in times of economic distress, uh, even if you have a long-term rapid growth uh, uh, commitment, makes sense. I will note, however, that I was last week in India, and the microfinance sector there is growing very quickly. Uh, the economy there is better than in most of the world. Uh, just to give you one sense, an MFI that didn't exist 18 months ago is now 80% of the size of Compartamos uh, that I visited just last week. Um, so, so the rapid growth uh, has to be calibrated to the economics. Secondly, I would have put in a higher level in that first group of factors, good products, uh, a good product mix for one's clientele. I, I'm coming to think that there are at least four different uh, niches or segments of poor, uh, and most microfinance organizations, I define them as destitute, very poor, moderate poor, formerly poor. Uh, and I think most microfinance has pretty good products for the moderate poor, and what normally happens is they apply those products to all four groups to the extent they interact with them. And so rapidly grow to have products for each of your niches, um, and I've certainly learned a lot from Funk Jose that presented here yesterday about this, uh, is very important. Uh, th third, uh, on the financing side, not all financing is created equal. Uh, Deposit-led MFIs and with strong deposit programs have weathered this crisis better, uh, and also ones that have borrowed in their local currency from the capital markets have, uh, have fared better. So, um, so it's not just having adequate financing, but having it from the right kinds of sources, uh, particularly when you need, are ready for a, a downturn. And lastly, I think we would have emphasized more in the paper that the importance of industry-wide, what I'll call shock absorbers, supporting organizations that you might call the, the meso level, uh, that can help the entire sector, including rapidly growing MFIs. And so I'm talking about credit bureaus that was mentioned in the previous session and also strong microfinance associations that can stick up for those organizations um, who are good at all, all levels of, of scaling up. So uh, that's uh, just an update on some of the thinking having done the original paper.